All right, welcome to the Nick Nao um, panel discussion for the Indigenous Pathways to Law. <clears throat> I'm, we're going to introduce ourselves really quick. Uh, I'm Rob Waldrop. Um, I'm a rising 3L at the University of New Mexico School of Law. Um, I'm Eastern Bend Cherokee from the Koala Boundary in Western North Carolina. Um, I am getting my Indian Law Certificate um, and I'm pursuing my Juris Doctor. Um, how about Dana, can you go next? Sure, I'm Dana Chavis. I am a 2020 graduate of the North Carolina School, I'm sorry, the North Carolina Central University School of Law. Um, I am Lumbee, um, grew up in Rayford, North Carolina, and I'm now living in Durham. Aaron. Sure. Uh, my name is Erin Locklear. I am a uh, 2002 graduate of the University of North Carolina School of Law, and uh, <clears throat> that's been a long time ago now. Um, I am Lumby. Um, I grew up in Fairmont. Um, for those of you familiar with that part of the world, I grew up in uh, near Five Forks in the um, Dougalsville is what they technically call my neighborhood near the, between Five Forks and Fairgrove School. So um, that's where I grew up. I um, am currently the general counsel for the Raleigh Durham Airport Authority. So that leaves Lydia. Hey y'all, my name is Lydia Locklear. I'm a citizen of the Lumbee tribe. I'm from Pembroke. I went to Pernell Sweat and went to UNCP for undergrad. And then I went to Michigan State University College of Law for law school and I got my Indian law certificate and my JD. And now I work as the deputy tribal attorney for the Catawba Indian Nation located in South Carolina. And I'm happy to be here with y'all. All right, Aaron, can you um, talk to us about some opportunities in the law? Um, sure. I think one of the things that comes up a lot of times that folks wonder about with the law is, um, can you be a lawyer? Does that, if you're a lawyer, does that mean you automatically have to go to court? Um, and some folks like to argue, some folks don't like to argue. So some folks want to be in court and some folks don't want to be in court. And I, I would say you can absolutely be a lawyer and not go to court. I would say most lawyers um, don't go to court. Um, I think TV tells you differently. If you watch TV, it looks like every lawyer um, wears really fancy suits and goes to court, but that's not really how it works. Um, I can tell you, I started my career um, doing courtroom work for the first five years um, amongst a lot of other things, but now I don't go to court hardly at all. Um, and some lawyers don't, don't, um, don't go to, to court at all. Some work in the legislature, some lobby, some work on forming a business or selling real estate, some do advocacy work, some do social justice work, um, some write wills, some write contracts, um, some help employers with personnel issues, and none of those involves co going to court. So you can kind of, one way I think to kind of think about it is, um, people generally go to court when they're fighting about something, like an agreement that's gone wrong, um, and, they, and the two sides disagree about the agreement, and, but there were probably lawyers that were involved before that ever happened in figuring out whatever the thing was that went sour. So in this example, that helped write the agreement or helped um, give folks legal advice about the agreement itself. So um, you can absolutely practice the law without going to court. Although many lawyers love going to court. And I know that um, Dana, I know she, um, she frequents courthouses in her work. So I'd be interested to hear from her. So opportunities in the law. Um, I do go to court. <laughs> Thanks for that, that um, heads up, Erin. I completely forgot to talk about my job earlier. I am a um, staff counsel with State Employees Credit Union, which is the largest credit union in North Carolina and the second largest um, in, in the country, I believe. Um, and we have a legal services department and I currently do litigation. So um, that's what I spend my days doing right now is um, 
writing complaints and and motions and, and things like that to, to take to court. Um, I travel quite a bit. Um, I enjoy it. It's something interesting that that um, that I'm learning to do, but I, I don't foresee myself doing that forever. Um, I have coworkers in, in my department who will never go to court. They do things like, um, like Aaron mentioned, like personnel issues. Um, we have a compliance group. They're reviewing everything to make sure we're compliant with, with like all the federal and state laws that you know we're regulated by. Um, other opportunities, um, I have classmates that would love to, um, to be professors at some point. Um, that's not something I, I would ever see myself again doing. I've taught before, that's, that's not my calling. Um, but there are certainly lots of opportunities for, for people um, who obtain a law degree um, and pass the bar or not pass the bar, you can still use your, your JD degree, um, certainly. So Lydia? Yeah, thanks, Dana. I am one of those that are like, I don't want to go to court. I'm good. I'm going to stay out of court. But uh, it's important to get that experience. So even though I said, I don't think I want to be in the courtroom, I did moot court during law school. And so I had to write a brief and argue in court. And that gave me that experience. And so if I need to, I will definitely do it. Um, some people will just get a real thrill out of it. And, and they, they just want to stay in the courtroom. Um, I'm in-house counsel for a tribe. And uh, it's always been my dream to, to work for a tribe. And now I'm living my dream. Um, and so when you're in-house counsel for a government, you encounter all sorts of things. Like um, maybe you have to handle this, um, some issue, uh, you know, going on in the, in the tribe. Um, you advise usually the uh, different branches of the government sometimes, unless you're a huge tribe and you have attorneys for each branch of the government, um, you draft contracts, you have to deal with all types of different law. And a lot of people are like, oh, you work for a tribe, what kind of law do you do? I'm like, all types, all types, you know, employment law, housing law, um, just everything, gaming law. So it's, it's, it's a lot and I love it. I love learning new things every single week. Um, it's really exciting. But before this, I was clerking at the North Carolina Supreme Court. So some people want to be judicial law clerks. And when you are a judicial clerk, you do a lot of research and you do a lot of writing. You help write um, memos, which are just summaries, uh, you know, a summary of a case and um, what this side is arguing and what that side is arguing. Um, you also help draft opinions that later become, you know, once your judge or justice looks over it, um, they really write the opinion and you help. But that becomes a law in the state. And that was really exciting to be a part of that. And I was clerking for Justice Anita, Anita Earls. And, and she's just an amazing, awesome, um, inspiring woman. But I was there for almost a year. But there were clerks there that that were like career clerks. They had done it for 10 years. And I could see how they, you know, when you get in the mood, you, you just know what to do. And then it comes second nature. And um, it was a really interesting and exciting job. I mean, you don't think sitting down and researching and writing all the time would be exciting, but you learn so much about everything, criminal law, administrative law, um, business law. It's just so much at the court. So working in the courts, um, not in the courtroom, but behind the scenes, it's a great opportunity in the law. And like Dana said, um, working in the schools, you know, being a professor, I, I would love to one day teach a class, but I, I think that's exciting as well. So you don't have to go on and take the bar. Um, having a just doctorate degree is just a, an excellent higher education degree. What about you, Rob? Well, since I'm closer to the whole JD experience, um, I'm going into my last year. Um, I could speak a little bit about some of the opportunities that you encounter while in law school. Um, I think that law school is a really good place to dip your toes into a lot of different areas. Um, like Lydia was saying, um, moot court is a really good opportunity, um, especially if you don't think that you're interested in doing litigation and going to court a lot. Um, I think it's important to get that experience. Um, I did a moot court competition um, and it's, it's really important to 
understand, you know, how to file things, how to draft a motion, how to, you know, uh, present yourself in front of the court. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, subject areas that are tested on the bar and things that are not tested on the bar that you can take courses on that um, can pique your interest in an area and you might want to, you know, see yourself working in that area later on in your practice. Um, whether you take the bar or not, um, there are several um, uh, jobs that are labeled uh, JD Advantage positions that um, allow you to take that position without having to uh, take the bar at all. Um, and I, I think that that should be highlighted because um, just because you're going to law school doesn't mean you have to be a lawyer. Um, I, I think that um, there's a lot of opportunities that are overlooked, um, especially in studying Indian law. Um, because um, Indian law is so uh, vast as far as the uh, interest areas go. I know Lydia talked about that. Uh, you practice every single area when you practice Indian law. Um, and one of the really cool things about Indian law particularly is the fact that indigenous people have their own traditional law too. Um, and that's something that is often overlooked um, and something that people just don't think about. Um, one of the opportunities that you can get, get involved in in law school is being on a law journal. Um, I'm going to be the editor in chief of the tribal law journal here at uh, the University of New Mexico next year. Um, it's a really important um, and worthwhile opportunity to have just because you're able to work with scholars in the area and students as well who are trying to submit scholarship that's furthering um, the law in that area. Um, and one of the really cool opportunities that I've had is uh, right now, I am a summer law clerk at the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I'm doing a lot of research and writing like Lydia was talking about as a law clerk. Um, and I've uh, you know, had some really great experiences outside of that too. I was a research assistant last semester for a professor um, and it was amazing just to you know see some different areas of the law that I was not familiar with at all doing legislative history research, which is very, very boring, but uh, it was, you know, interesting just to see what you don't want to do too. Um, because I, I think that's just as important as finding something that you love. Um, so we're, we're going to transition now. Um, and I'm going to ask Lydia to um, talk about the importance of native practitioners and you know maybe some native practitioners that she's inspired by uh, thank you rob on your same um on that same note about federal indian law i just want to say you know we're all native and just because you're native doesn't mean you have to do federal indian law um you know we need you i mean we need more native lawyers native practitioners we definitely need more um native judges um, in the federal courts of the United States, 230 year history, there have only been four Native Americans to serve as judges in the federal courts, only four in 230 years. Um, that's, that's alarming. Um, so our whole goal, the Indigenous Pathways to Law, um, our whole goal is to increase that number, increase the number of Native American practitioners, Native American judges. Um, and so we would love to, to have you in our group, but I just wanted to throw that out there and talk a little bit about federal Indian law as well. Um, it's the, the study of the federal government, the relationship, relationship between the federal government and Native American tribes. And then there's also the relationship between tribes and the state governments. Um, but every tribe um, has its own culture, like Rob was saying, has its own laws. Um, and tribes are political entities. They're, they're, they're self-governing bodies. And so that's why they can have that relationship with the state and that relationship with the federal government. So it's very complex because you have all this law up here, but then you also have the tribe's own laws that you have to, to learn. So it's, it's, it's exciting to do. Indian law is really exciting. <laughs> um, but um, um, Rob, you asked me about any inspirational uh, native practitioners. Um, I would say Julian Pierce, um, he was Lumbee. And in 1978, he um, became the first director of the Lumbee River Legal Services, which is located in Pembroke. 
and it's now legal aid. It's uh, part of legal aid of North Carolina. So um, he spent a lot of his time serving um, Robinson County and the communities there. Um, some more um, inspiring practitioners would be Arlinda Locklear. Um, she's Lumbee, she's in DC and she's argued in the Supreme Court many times. One of the first um, Native American women to argue in the Supreme Court, um, really inspirational. And then I could, I could go on and name more. I feel like I have a whole list, but I just, I won't really go there right now, but um, there are so many inspiring, especially women. Um, a lot of um, women that are just inspiring in, in our communities, in our tribal communities. Um, uh, Rob, do you, do you have any that you wanna mention? Yeah, I do. Um... I particularly want to shout out to our new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland. Um, she was class of 2006 from UNM School of Law. Um, and I want to shout out to my um, prior supervisor, Bonnie Claxton, the managing attorney of the EBCI uh, Legal Assistance Office. Um, she is very good at her job. She uh, you know, puts her whole heart in it and is very much there to um, you know, put the needs of uh, the tribe forward um, as far as tribal sovereignty goes and on an individual level, um, tribal clients. And I, I think that's really what the practice should be about. Um, and I can go on and on to mentioning several names, but I, I, I'll just leave it at that. Um, Dana, do you have anyone that you wanted to mention? I do, and um, one of them is actually a, a family member. Um, my great uncle, Henry Ward Oxendine, he was one of the first native students at the North Carolina um, Central School of Law. Um, right when desegregation was happening, he, he entered, he was in that first class um, of native students who attended Central. Um, I didn't um, know him that well. I, I, met him when I was a teenager um, and didn't realize like really who he was and what a part of history he was um, until I was much older. Um, and so my school has honored him um, by putting, they, they have murals downstairs um, at, at Central, at NCCU. And he is in the mural, um, which, which is pretty awesome. Um, but he was also um, the first Native American to serve in the North Carolina General Assembly, um, which happened shortly after he graduated um, from law school at Central. So he was on my, he was the top of my list. Um, Julian Pierce, of course, I have, my, my parents knew, grew up with his family, um, which is, and I remember when he was killed, you know, un unfortunately, um, and that made, I think, a, a bigger impact on me than, than I ever realized. Um, but he kind of stood out, you know, as a kid, like knowing, because I didn't know my uncle at that point, my great uncle, I'd never met him at that point. And to, to see this happen played, played a huge you know, um, impact on me as a child. And one of my good friends from college, Jody Cummings, um, we went to Duke undergrad together. And he is actually the general counsel for the Mashantucket Pequot tribe, um, tribal nation, I'm sorry, in Connecticut. And they own this huge resort, which I'm sure, um, I'm sure Lydia knows a lot, a lot about that being, being in that business herself, but, um, and I would be, uh, I, I, it, it wouldn't be fair for me not to mention Judge Brooke Clark. She actually did my swearing in ceremony when I got sworn in um, last fall. She is married to a, a cousin of mine, so, you know, I, I reached out and I was like, hey, get, I actually sent her a message on Facebook and she was like, I would love to do it. So um, she was our, the first um, Native American woman judge in North Carolina. So so we I, I could go on and on like I'm sure um, everyone else could. But now we're going to hear from from Miss Erin. The bad thing about going last in this question is everybody has said most of the names that I was going to mention. I was going to mention um, Julian Pierce, obviously. I um, 
I was, uh, I watched a panel that his daughter Julia was on and I told her, I too remember Dana when um, he was killed and it made a huge, it's like one of those things you remember how old you were and how you felt when that happened. And um, I told her about that same time, I discovered two influences in my life, Julian Pierce and Atticus Finch. And I felt like they're in good company with each other. So I was certainly gonna mention um, Julian Pierce. Um, I was gonna mention Arlinda Locklear, obviously. Um, um, I was gonna mention um, Brooke, uh, Judge Brooke Clark. Although I have to stop myself from saying Judge Brooke Locklear, <laughs> um, Judge Brooke Clark, who I knew in law school and is just a fantastic person. Um, I also was going to say Jody Cummings. I went to the School of Science and Math with Jody. Um, we were friends there, and he's a great role model and um, just has done amazing things with his life and would be a great and is very inspirational as a person and in all the work that he's done. He's big fat fancy, y'all. So, um, um, yeah, he's up there. Um, I also would add to that list Matthew Scott, um, uh, who has done big things as the DA in Robinson County, um, and um, I think is a true inspiration as well. Um, so um, that was sort of my list. Uh, overall, though, I would say, you know, you, I would bet, uh, as my mom says, I would bet dollars to donuts that um, if you meet a native um, lawyer, particularly if you met a, a North Carolina native lawyer, listen to their story because it's going to be inspirational, um, no matter. Um, so even if we haven't mentioned the names, even if they're not well known or renowned, um, take time, meet with them, talk with them, reach out to them, whether it's the one up the road or the one across the country, um, it, it'll be well worth your time. And I'll, I'll echo that, Erin. I wanted to also add Heather Nockai. Um, she worked for, and still I think works for the National Indian Gaming Commission. She's done a lot um, for the Lumbee people, uh, for our tribe and for native peoples throughout the country. And then, you know, there's um, Angelica McIntyre. She's a native judge in Robinson County, as well as Brooke. Um, and Danielle McLean is the attorney for the Lumbee tribe. So I wanted to give her a shout out. And then Candace Harkey uh, is the managing attorney for the League Weight of North Carolina. And um, Judge Dees, well, he used to be a judge, uh, another Lumbee lawyer um, that, you know, helped me while I was at Legal Aid and has been a servant of our community for um, decades. So I just wanted to recognize them. All right, uh, thank you guys for that. Um, and Dana, um, I was gonna ask you about, um, you know, talk to us about your journey in becoming a lawyer and um, just how to become a lawyer in general. Um, any tips you might, might have to the um, individuals that are watching this uh, recording? I had a very long journey to becoming an attorney. Um, like Erin, I, I was a graduate of the School of Science and Math in Durham and um, <laughs> go unis. Um, and I, I went to Duke undergrad, planned to, to be a, a math major and actually I wanted to be a math professor. That was, that was my goal. Um, loved math, did not have a good math experience. <laughs> Um, during undergrad and started exploring different options. I took a, um, a class on Native American history with Dr. Peter Wood. And um, through that class, I just developed more of an interest in, in learning about, you know, Native history. Um, and then the law just kind of, kind of, it just kind of fell into place. Um, that was in 1995, 96. Um, so I didn't actually start law school until 2016. So there's like a 20 year gap in the, in the interim. I, I got married, got divorced, had, you know, had, had my children and attempted to go back to law school again in 2006 um, at Campbell. Um, that didn't work out. I, went through the, the, what they call the PBAP program. 
And I do have to mention that during my undergrad career at Duke, um, you know, like a lot of native students, there wasn't a lot of support on campus. Um, and when you grow up in an environment like I did, that was very structured, um, even though I had the science and math experience, when I got to Duke, I did not adjust well. Um, and I actually um, failed out of college, like completely, like never in my wildest dreams would, you know, I have ever imagined that that would happen to me. Um, so I took two semesters off. I had to reapply to get back in. And so again, I was still like, you know, I don't know if I can even go to law school at this point. Like I literally had on my transcript, all Fs for that semester. Um, parents were not happy. You know, it, it, it was a lot going home with, with, with that. Um, so, you know, I, I, in 2006, when I didn't get into Campbell, I um, said, I'm, I'm going to school. I wanted to go back to school. So I started my master's program at um, UNC Pembroke, um, got my degree, um, where I was working full time by that point. Um, and when I graduated in 2011, that desire to go to law school was still there. Um, so two years later, I took a job. I was, I was working at the credit union at the time, had been working there since 2005 as a teller, loan officer, all kinds of things. Um, I took a job in 2013 and I came to Raleigh um, and I was in the trust services department and my boss had just started law school at Central. And it was like, it was like bells went off, you know, it was like, ah, oh, this is this is the aha moment. And she said, I can't promise you that we'll pay for you to go to law school. And I was like, I don't care about that. I, I know I wanna go. Um, so I took the LSAT in 2015, um, the fall of 2015 and, um, again, got into the PBAP program at Central. They said, maybe, maybe we'll accept you. I was just glad to get the letter that says they're, they're giving me a chance because I knew what my undergrad, um, you know, my undergrad um, grades were, were not great. Um, I did have a 4.0 in, in my master's program, but they don't care about that. They look at your, your undergrad grades. Um, and I was successful in PBAP and got into the evening program. So that meant I was working full time, going to law school three nights a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, from 6.30 to 9.30. Um, that, I, I still don't know how I did it. Um, I had two kids, one was in, um, they were both in high school when I started. One graduated from law school when, I'm sorry, graduated from college. Um, and the other one is, is still in college now, um, but I did it, you know, I graduated last year and, and during COVID and. And y'all not to be interrupting Dana, but the night program at the North Carolina Central University School of Law is incredibly challenging and difficult. Like that's amazing. It's amazing. It, it was, it was unlike anything I ever imagined. Um, I could, I could even do. Um, so, you know, the road to law school is not always an easy one. It's not always, you know, you graduate with great grades from undergrad and you apply and you get in and then you go straight. Not everyone has the same path. Um, I wouldn't want to discourage anyone because if anyone had ever looked at my transcript from undergrad, like they would say, oh, she, she's never, she's never going to law school. But, you know, I did. I graduated with honors from, from law school um, at Central and passed the bar on the first time. And, and that was an accomplishment in and of itself <laughs> during COVID. So um, that's, that still blows my mind that that happened. It's, it's still very surreal that, that I'm here. Um, but I, I don't remember what else I was supposed to talk about. Any, anyone want to help me out here? Um, any tips that you can give uh, the students on if they are interested in going to law school? Um, law school requires a lot of reading. 
So if you're not, if you don't like to read, um, learn to like to read or, or at least develop um, um, the habit of reading and read different things. Like I, I think just being able to, to read and analyze um, the classes that I took, like as a, as a history major certainly helped me, um, the, anything in the social sciences. Not to say that people with, you know, who are interested interested in science and, and math can't do well in law school, because that's certainly not true. Um, but but I do think that when you have that analytical skill that you develop from from reading, um, that's definitely a good tool to have. And and start early, you know. You can wait 20 years like me, but I don't advise that route. Um, Lydia. Let's let's jump over to you. Hey, um, well, my law school journey was I didn't know when I was y'all's age. I did not know what I wanted to do, um, but I did know I wanted to go into higher education. I knew I wanted to go to college. And so if you're sitting there now and you don't know what you want to do, but you want to go to college or maybe you think you don't want to go to college, you could always change your mind. And that's why it's so important now to make good grades and do your best in school because you never know what you'll want to do, you know, and, you know, law schools, med schools, you know, uh, higher education, they, they look at those grades, they're important. But like Dana said, they're not everything. Um, you know, schools are looking for a well-rounded person. So definitely get involved in your community. And, you know, one way to get involved in your communities is to be involved in this group, the Indigenous Pathways to Law. So. I'll just put that out there, but um, it wasn't until college at UNCP that I took an Indian law class, and I was like, I love this, I love it. So then I was kind of late to the game. I decided I wanted to go. To, I wanted to go to law school. I didn't have like any guidance, so that was kind of overwhelming. But um, to echo what Aaron said earlier, reach out. Don't be afraid to reach out to Native lawyers in your community. Every single Native lawyer I've ever reached out to has been immensely helpful. Never, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, I met such and such, um, they're an attorney and, and they weren't really helpful. You know, maybe they saw me as competition. Uh, I've never felt that way. They've always been so nice and so helpful. So don't be afraid. If you have lawyers at your church, um, reach out to them. So um, I just wanna encourage that. And so I decided I wanted to go to law school and I found this program called the Pre-Law Summer Institute. It's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's eight weeks. It's a law school boot camp for native students. It was my first time away from home. I cried. Um, it, was, it was very tough, but it is so intense. And you take um, first year law classes plus an Indian law course and um, it's intense, but uh, it was some of the best times in my short life. Um, you become so close to the other students in the program and you meet students from around the, the country. And so um, it was it was an awesome experience and it prepares you for law school. And then there are some people I went that were in that program with me that decided they didn't want to go to law school. And that's why programs like that are important. Um, you know, job shadowing a lawyer right now at your age is important. Just ask them, you know, maybe you're interested, maybe you're not. And so just as important as knowing what you want to do is knowing what you don't want to do. So those are just some short tips. Um, so I went to law school at Michigan State and um, I loved my experience there. I took um, Indian law courses. I took obviously the, the general um, law courses that you have to take to get your JD. And I was very involved in the Native American Law Student Association and the National Native American Law Student Association. I did the um, NASA moot court competition. And um, so it's, again, I'm stressing that it's important to be involved in your community, in your school, um, wherever you're at, yeah, whatever stage you're at in your life, it's important to um, be involved. And, um, and then fast forward, that no one really talks about when we're, you're talking about going to law school is the bar, the bar exam. So Dana touched on that. It's it's super hard. Um, law school is three years. Um, you know, you think three years, I'm gonna be a lawyer. Um, then the bar exam hits you in the face. So I'm cruising, everything's great. You know, you think three years and you're good. Um, 
it may be six years, you know, for, for other lawyers, it may be 10 years. You know, I've, I've seen and heard of lawyers taking the bar exam like 10 times and, and, and they, they do it, you know, some just decide, okay, it's not for me and they do something else and that's okay. Some are, you know, are um, persistent and they eventually pass the bar exam. The first time I took it, I was, I think 11 points away from passing in North Carolina. And then I took it back to back. It's only offered twice a year. I took it the next time it was offered and I was closer, but I failed again. And so just imagine this discouragement. Dana talked about rejection. You know, I have, I've been rejected from plenty of law schools. Well, not plenty, but this is another important tip. Cast a net, not a line. You know, there may be one school you really want to go to, but it's important to cast a net and apply to different law schools, you know, be diverse. Um, so I did, you know, I didn't get into some law schools. I got into some other law schools. I was waitlisted at one. So um, that's important, but that, that didn't really bother me too much. Like I got where I wanted to go, Michigan State. Um, passing or failing the bar exam, that's important because you can't practice law. Um, every state has their own bar exam. And then there's something called like the UBE, a universal bar exam. And I think about half the states have adopted that. So if you take the UBE in one state and score high enough, you may can be sworn into another state, uh, depending on if they have the UBE. So after that, I was just like, wow, I need to keep going. And so um, I heard that North Carolina was offering, well, adopting this UBE exam the next um, like the next year, but there was a bar exam that I could take within this year, right, for example. And so I said, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not waiting any longer. So I took three exams back to back and I went up to DC and I took the UBE, which is was a different exam than the one in North Carolina that I took. And I um, passed and I scored high enough that I can um, be barred in like half the states in the country. I'm barred in North Carolina, South Carolina and DC. It's just, um, well, my friend, he wrote an article, and I love this quote. He said, rejection hurts. Repeated rejection stings. Befriend it anyway. And that is, like, I just, I love that quote, and I embrace it. You know, like, Dana didn't give up. I didn't give up. There were things in my life during that time that could have slowed me down. But you, if you have a goal, do everything you can to meet that goal. So um, I just want to say it's okay to be rejected. It's okay to be rejected again and again and again. Um, keep moving because it's not just you that you're doing it for. You know, it's your family, but it's your whole community. You know, it's your tribe. And you know, what motivated me was, um, our, you know, our people are depending on us to, to give, them, give them better, you know. And so me as an attorney, I was like, I want to learn as much as I can. Just, you know, I, I still want to learn as much as I can. So I can offer our people the best, you know, legal, legal assistance. And so that's kind of my story is um, if you get knocked down, just get back up and keep going because there are so many people relying on you and behind you, pushing you and supporting you. Erin, do you want to tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I think it's really interesting hearing the two of you extremely educated, extremely well-spoken, very well-respected, very high-achieving women talk about challenges in your road. And I think it's a really great lesson to folks to say, it won't be perfect. And there won't be, there may not be, everything may not be a Prince Charming moment where you try on the glass slipper and it fits. You know, sometimes you're gonna have to work and try and work and try and take a turn and take another turn and go over a bridge, build your own canoe to go under the bridge. I mean, there it's just um, to hear the two of you, I think this is a really great example and very heartwarming examples of, um, we think success looks like a straight line, but it really is a plate of spaghetti. Um, and I think that, that um, you two have really shown that in a very heartfelt way. And I really appreciate hearing your stories. Um, as for me, um, um, you know, my mama always said when I was growing up that I should be a lawyer because I would argue with a stop sign. 
And um, even though I, I didn't believe that then, I think um, um, as always, mama was right, because um, clearly here I am. But um, um, I will say I went to college at Prince in Princeton University. And when I started college, I was absolutely sure what I wanted to do. There was very little doubt in my mind. I was gonna be an engineer. You can see exactly how that worked out because I sit here not as an engineer. Um, I was an engineer in college for almost two years and I really didn't like it. I really um, was pushing through and persevering um, because I thought it was the right thing to do. And um, I thought I'd get a four-year degree and I'd be able to get out and I could make money and I wouldn't have to go to graduate school and I'd be set. Um, and I really just didn't enjoy it. I, I was so sure of that path and I really did not enjoy it. So at some time I sort of said, um, you know, for, I need to forget engineering. And in taking those classes, um, that curriculum is so filled up, there's very little chance to pick things that you wanna take just because you enjoy them. And when I decided not to do engineering, I said, I'm really gonna take this opportunity. I'm just gonna take classes that I enjoy because that was such a, like, it just seemed so amazing to me that I could pick classes and I could like take things that I enjoyed. So I took a real wide um, sort of swath of classes. And I, 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 a couple of those classes really were what led me to law school. One of them was um, American Constitutional Interpretation where um, a law school um, professor, former law, law, law school professor taught us about the constitution. And um, that's a powerful document. That's a powerful history to learn. And it's very powerful to look at it through a legal lens. And that was really the first time I had done that, critically thinking about the foundations of our country through a legal lens. So I thought that was really interesting. And, then I took a class called the Psychology of Justice, which was basically about, it was a psychology class, but it was about how we perceive justice and how who we are and our life experiences and our cultural experiences really give us a lens to, to think about what we think of as justice. And man, I just thought that was an amazing way to think about it because I think before then I didn't see all that spectrum I saw it, it's black and it's white, um, but learning the law and being introduced to the law in that way really showed all the gray <laughs> that's all in there. And I see everybody nodding because much of what we all do <laughs> is work in the gray. <laughs> so um, I, you know, those classes really showed me that my mama was right. I should have just listened to her from the beginning and um, y'all don't tell her <laughs> that I said that. <laughs> Always right, Erin. Yeah, yeah, always. And so, um, so yeah, that's what led me to, to apply to law school um, and um, really led me through what was a very challenging um, time as an undergrad. Um, so, um, you know, really helped me sort of carve my own path and figure out a way to put academics and my cultural beliefs together in this package that I thought was really interesting and really drew me to it. So. Yeah, so um, I think if I was to give folks tips on applying to law school, one of them would be, don't be so sure that you're right. <laughs> um, like, listen to me. Don't be so sure that you're right, that you give yourself this narrow road. You never know where you're gonna find that diamond um, and be open to finding it. Do things that make you uncomfortable. Um, work really hard. Getting good grades is never a bad thing. <laughs> Never, ever, ever. It always will help you. Always, always, always. Um, I echo what other folks have said. Try to get exposure or experience with legal, the legal world now, whether that's through volunteering, interning, getting a part-time job as a mail delivery clerk, <laughs> whatever it might be. Just being around lawyers is really going to be helpful. That shadowing, reaching out to lawyers. I know all the lawyers within IPL would be happy to hear from anybody and would be happy to, to talk to you. Um, and I think also one tip I would say is um, that sort of idea of not being so narrow is I think there's an idea of, well, what will I major in when I'm in college to be able to go to law school, right? Because for other 
um, like if you're in med school, that's a really regulated curriculum that you need to take in order to get to med school. But law school is much more open. And I think there's a real assumption that you should major in politics or history to go to law. And you can do that. That's totally fine. Nothing wrong with any of those. But you can major in anything and go to law school. What I think is most important is that you find something you care about and you do well in it and you really um, maximize that opportunity. I ended up majoring in sociology and I had a minor in American studies. Um, that worked fine, that worked great for me. Um, some folks are really interested in science um, and they may get an undergraduate degree in science and they really set themselves up to be a patent attorney eventually. So there's really no one way to get to law school. The thing that I would just say is hustle, 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 hustle. You know, they mentioned pre-law programs that um, have been mentioned, um, um, hustling to find lawyers that you can talk to to shadow um, and um, hustling to get scholarships or figuring out other information. You know, um, looking at NALSA um, and, and national NALSA, um, great groups to get ideas and information from. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I think overall I would just say, don't be so sure that you're right, but also I think as we've heard from this panel, don't be so sure you're wrong either. Um, you know, just hustle, 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 and, and you just never know what might happen and what might come. So Rob, be nice to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, uh, now I don't want to go last. Um, you guys are really inspiring. Um, I um, definitely had the, the same kind of experience. I uh, thought that I knew what I wanted to do, but it turns out I didn't. Um, I started my undergrad um, in New Orleans, actually, um, at Loyola University and Tulane University. Um, and I was first a biology major. Uh, I wanted to go to med school. Um, that didn't work out. Um, I hated it. Um, I then, you know, was really interested in uh, literature. Um, I didn't like that either. Um, <laughs> and the one thing that really, you know, grabbed my attention and held it was a course that I took on ancient Greek philosophy. Um, and so I switched my major to classics. Um, and after becoming a classics major, I quickly realized that the program that I was in really didn't fit with where I wanted to go at the time. Uh, I wanted to be Indiana Jones. And so I transferred to UNC Chapel Hill um, and I finished my undergrad degree there. Um, I still wanted to be Indiana Jones all the way until the last semester of my uh, uh, time at UNC. Uh, and then I took a course on um, Shakespeare. Um, and it's, it's really odd to say, but that's what made me want to go to law school. Um, there's several different themes throughout Shakespeare's plays, but justice is a big one. Um, and it's talked about in nearly every single one of his plays. Um, and it, it was something that I ended up writing the paper for the class about. Um, and after thinking about it and thinking about, you know, where I wanted my career to go um, as far as going to law school, um, I thought about, you know, where, where do I want to serve my community from? Because that was really important to me. Um, I, uh, you know, took like an introspective look at, uh, what I was studying, uh, classics, um, ancient Greek language, uh, Latin and Roman, uh, culture, um, and thought about, you know, well, that's really, that was the driving force behind the people that conquered the Americas. Um, and I, I thought, well, you know, that's a really important pers uh, perspective to have, uh, if you want to serve, uh, a tribal community, uh, knowing how, you know, this entire philosophy of the conqueror was built um, and knowing how it can be dismantled as well. Um, I uh, took that thought and I 
took a little bit of time off. Um, I worked for the Harris Cherokee Casino for a couple of years. Um, I worked at Disney. Um, and yeah, I um, lived and worked in a, a bunch of different places in that time. Um, and then I started applying. Um, and I did a lot of research. Um, and I actually only applied to schools that I actually really wanted to go to. Um, I did not apply. I didn't actually cast a very wide net at all. I applied to five schools and those five schools were places that I knew that I could see myself at um, that had a good program in Indian law because that's where I wanted to focus my attention, um, but also had a wide variety of things that they were known for besides just Indian law in case, you know, there was a flicker of my mind changing or anything of that sort, uh, so I could, you know, still diversify if I needed to. Um, and then I took the LSAT. Um, I definitely recommend doing a prep course uh, for the LSAT. Uh, I think it's really important. Um, the LSAT is a really uh, useful tool to have um, on your side, on your application. Um, also, all of your application materials, make sure to have several eyes look over them. Um, Make sure to have uh, any of your undergrad mentors, uh, professors, um, even high school teachers, if you're still in touch with them at that point, um, have everyone you can look over them and make sure to build some good references in your time uh, throughout your undergraduate journey. If law school is where you wanna be, um, think about PLSI as Lydia mentioned, um, it's a really great program. I wasn't able to do it because I was working at the time, but um, all of my friends have done it. Uh, it's really important to, uh, you know, stay involved throughout your undergraduate career. Um, and something else um, that Aaron had mentioned, um, you know, several people expect you to major in political science or history or something like that to go to law school. A lot of admissions committees are actually, you know, discouraged by that uh, just because they see so many. Um, so I, I think that having diversity in your application is really important. So take what you want to um, as your undergrad major, take the courses that interest you um, and really see where you can go from there. Um, and if law school is still what you wanna do after that, um, go right ahead because they, they love to see uh, people from various backgrounds. Um, and I, I think that the, the best thing that I've done since I got into the school where I wanted to go was uh, getting involved very early on. Um, I think one of the big mistakes that um, first year law students make is being um, kind of apprehensive about getting involved um, just because you know the first year is really important as far as your grades go. Um, but at the same time, I still think that it's, it's plausible to be able to juggle all of that and be able to get involved some as well. Uh, you don't have to do everything. Um, you can, you know, limit yourself to one commitment um, and that could be it. Um, my first year, I uh, was involved in the Native American Law Student Association. Um, my second year, I was vice president of um, the UNM NALSA and next year I'll be the president. Um, this past year, I kind of overcommitted myself. So you definitely have to watch out for that as well. Um, it, it's hard to uh, say no sometimes uh, when you uh, start to get into your community, especially when you know that what you could be doing would be helping people uh, in the long run. But uh, at the same time, I think, you know, your own well being is very important. Um, especially when you're trying to be successful at the very end of your career. Um, and that's really the, the tips that I have um, in high school, you know, focus on um, getting good grades, challenging yourself, you know, taking those advanced placement courses, um, making sure to reach out early to talk to people who are in the legal profession, whether it be lawyers, paralegals, anyone that, you know, does anything related to the law, um, people in the legislature, people that, um, you know, write contracts, um, people that have never been in a courtroom, but still uh, work on things that are related to the law. Um, get a lot, all those perspectives, because you never know what you might be interested in. 
And I think that is about all the time that we have. Um, if any of you guys would like to speak a little bit more about the Indigenous Pathways to Law program before we hop off, uh, that'd be great. Uh, otherwise, you guys can field your questions to our live discussion panel. I just want to add thank you everyone for listening to our stories. Uh, uh, like Aaron said, reach out to us um, if you have questions. Our uh, contact information can be provided if you would like it. And please uh, become involved with our group, uh, the Indigenous Pathways to Law. Um, it's a mentorship program to North Carolina's tribal communities. As you know, we have eight tribes here in North Carolina, so many uh, Indigenous peoples um, throughout our state and we are launching our mentorship program to um, you all. And um, we're excited about that, where you will be put with a mentor, someone that can um, meet with you either in person or virtually like this and guide you, you know, what classes should I take? Um, you know, um, where should I apply for college? I mean, a mentor can help you with school related questions and you know, personal questions as well. I mean, just life questions. And so um, we hope that you become involved in our program and our mentorship program. And we meet regularly uh, monthly to just have discussions like this. So we hope that you all will join us. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, you can get involved any way that you want to. Um, we have a mentorship program. Um, you can contact us individually, um, however you want to uh, proceed. Thank you, guys.